So we are in our last message in the book of Galatians. And this really, I think, summarizes the entire book. It's a good cap on all, everything. It wraps up the whole thing, all the themes that we've seen in this book related to the gospel. And today we're going to talk about the new identity that we can have as individuals and as a church. New identities. A couple of weeks ago, I was listening to a podcast by Malcolm Gladwell. Some of you have read books by him. He's a great author, New York Times bestseller. He has a podcast called Revisionist History. And one of the stories he told in his podcast was about a CIA informant. The CIA informant in 1987 came forward voluntarily, without being recruited, without being coerced, without being offered money. He just offered himself, coming forward, and said, hey, I want to give information to help you guys catch terrorists. And the CIA, they, they said, okay, this never happens. <laughs> they usually have to work on informants for years, but this guy came forward voluntarily. You see, he had been involved himself in a lot of illegal activity for years, for decades. And something had changed in his life, and all of a sudden he wanted to help instead of hurt. He wanted to, to make amends for the things that he had done in his past. And he was one of the best informants the CIA ever had. And in fact, because of his information that he provided, the U.S. was able to track down Carlos the Jackal. And you may remember Carlos the Jackal because he was a terrorist from Venezuela who was the notorious um, terrorist. He was the most wanted terrorist. He was o Osama bin Laden before there was bin Laden. He was the worst terrorist in the world. In the 70s and 80s, he had masterminded terrorist acts that had killed 83 different people. And yet, because of this informant coming forward, the U.S. was able to capture him in 1994. Well, when this happened, a lot of the press was investigating, okay, how, did we, how were we able to catch this Carlos the Jackal, who, who had been, for years, for decades, been able to elude and evade the U.S. best effort to track him down? And they found out that there was this informant, and some people leaked some information about him. And here's the issue that people had. It turns out that this informant had been a terrorist himself. In fact, in Western Europe, he had been directly involved in two bombings that had killed U.S. citizens. So some people involved in the CIA and in the government couldn't, couldn't imagine us working with a terrorist. So they released the information to the press, got leaked out, and it turned out that people figured out who this informant was, and he was killed by the other terrorists. See, people couldn't understand that this former terrorist who had killed people, how could he now become one of the best informants and helpers we have? No, 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 that doesn't happen. People don't change their identity like that. As I listened to that story, I thought about it because in our world, it's hard to change our identity, isn't it? Most of us weren't involved in terrorist activity, but a lot of us have pasts that we're not proud about. Sometimes when we are in certain places, we say, oh, I can't believe I did that. We see people and we say, how could I have been in a relationship with that person? How could I have done those things? How could I have said that? And we, we relive the shame and this guilt we have from the past. And a lot of us try all sorts of different ways to create a new identity. We change our looks, our, our appearance, we, we, we lose weight, we, we move. We do whatever we can so that we can start with a new identity. But the reality is, as this informant found out, that it's nearly impossible, maybe impossible to do it on our own. We want to, but we can't. However, there is a way to have a new identity, a better identity. And it is through the cross of Jesus Christ. This was something the Apostle Paul really understood. You know, he wrote this book of Galatians, and he kind of was a terrorist. He terrorized Christians. He terrorized Christians. He hated Christians. He was one of the leading Jews, and he could not stand that there was this new group of people coming around that didn't worship his God, or at least he thought, that they were now worshiping this Jesus. So he went around, and literally his job was to persecute these people, throw them in prison. And when a man named Stephen, who was preaching the good news of Jesus Christ, was doing that, Paul watched in approval as a group of people picked up rocks, threw them at Stephen, and killed him. Paul was a terrorist. 
And yet, something transformed him. He personally knew what it was like to need a new identity. When he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, he realized that that past that he had was awful. He needed to leave that behind. He needed to go towards something new. And he also knew how hard it was to have a new identity. In Acts chapter 9, soon after he became a Christian, at the time his name was still Saul, he said when Saul came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. Even other Christians were reluctant to accept this person. Could he really have a new identity? Could he really be leaving his past behind? And that's the same thing some of us face when we become Christians or when we want a new identity. We, we try to claim it and people are like, I don't know. But the reality is through the cross of Christ, we can have that. And Saul, as we know, became Paul. He did change his identity. And this is what he says about his identity in Philippians chapter 3. He says, if someone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him. He had a new identity. So as he writes this final section, he wants us all to know that we can have a new identity too. That we can leave our past, our guilt, our shame, whatever we were in the past, we can leave that behind and become new. He did. He knew that it was the only way. And it was the only way through Jesus Christ. In fact, in Philippians 3.13, he said, I leave the past behind and with hands outstretched to whatever lies ahead, I go straight for the goal. And we too can do that find our new identity in Christ. So let's look at our passage in Galatians chapter 6, verse 11. Paul writes, See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. That's weird. This is actually Paul's signature here. So if you would have seen the original copy of this in the Greek, he would have had a scribe that wrote down everything. There was no word processing there was no dictation software. It wasn't even a typewriter. So you had to get scribes who could write well on very limited amount of parchment paper. So Paul would dictate his letters to the scribe. So the scribe's writing this down, but at the very end, he wants to ha make sure people know this is from him. So he writes with his own hands, and it's very big, he said, because the scribes had to write very small because paper was limited. So he's writing very big. He says, see what large letters. This is his signature. He's saying, I am assigning my name to this. It's that important. You've got to know that this comes directly from me. And as we saw in chapter um, 1 and 2 of this book, in our second sermon, that Paul was saying, hey, I met Jesus. I got the gospel from him. So once again, he's saying, hey, this is from me. This is from me. This comes straight from me, and I got it from Jesus. And then he goes on in verse 12. He says, those who want to impress people by means of the flesh are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this to is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised keep the law, yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your circumcision in the flesh. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here Paul is bringing up this theme that we've talked about. The, the reason why he wrote Galatians was in that, those churches in this region, there was some Judaizers, people who said, we believe in Jesus, but we also want to stay as Jews. We're going to make you get circumcised, follow the Jewish customs, the calendar. You've got to do all the Jewish rules if you want to be accepted by Jesus Christ. And of course, we've talked about over and over again that that's not what the gospel is. It's not the believe in Jesus Christ plus do this other stuff to be accepted by God. It's only believe in Jesus Christ. That's all that matters, is your faith in Jesus. So he's recapping this whole issue that he's been dealing with. It really came to a head in chapter 5. And then he's saying something really interesting, because he's never really talked about why these Judaizers are changing the gospel. But here he gives the reason. He says the only reason, in verse 12, the only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. The reason why they want to look and act like all the Jews, so the Jews won't persecute them. They're afraid. Because
because it's hard being a Christian. It was even harder in the first century where people like Saul, remember who he was, he would kill Christians. His job, he was getting paid to go capture them and imprison them. There were other Jews just like Saul, now Paul. So Christians were afraid, and they said, well, maybe we'll keep this part of our old religion and kind of hide the fact that we believe in Jesus. Now, I, I was thinking about this a lot because he says, being persecuted for the cross. Think about it. Why would someone be persecuted for the cross? Why does he say it like that? Because didn't everyone agree that Jesus died on a cross? Even atheists who hate Christians, historians say, yeah, Jesus died on a cross. It's an irrefutable fact. He died. He was this great teacher, this leader. People followed him, and then he died on a cross. He was crucified. Nobody debates that. So then why were the Jews, or why were these Judaizers afraid of being persecuted for the cross? And Paul, on the other hand, in verse 14, said, may I never boast except in the cross. And what's interesting, jump down to verse 17. Paul says, from now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. Now, some people wonder if Paul literally had been crucified and maybe survived it. But I think what he's saying is that he has been beaten. He has been whipped. He has been flogged. Being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Unlike the Judaizers who are afraid of what will happen to them if they believe. And in fact, in 2 Corinthians 11, Paul kind of gives his resume of persecution. He says, Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in dangers from bandits, in dangers from my fellow Jews, in dangers from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Why did he do all of that? Why would he go choose a life like that? It wasn't because Jesus died on a cross. Everybody agrees that. It's because of what the cross means. It's not just a physical event that happened in history. It's a spiritually significant event that changes history. Okay? It's because of what happened on the cross. Everybody agrees that Jesus was crucified. But not everyone agrees that it was the Son of God who died to take away the sins of the world. And it's for that that Paul is saying, I'm willing to go through all of this and more. I'm willing to die for this because that message is so important. And here's the point Paul is trying to make here at the very end of his book. Point one, the cross demands you take a controversial stand. It demands that you make a decision about what it represents. Everybody says it happened. But what do you say about what it means? Was it just a man who was a good teacher who died? I mean, that's inspirational, but it's not transformational. But if Jesus Christ was the Son of God, came here as an atoning sacrifice for our sins and for the sins of the world, then that is something that you might get killed if you believe. So we have to make a decision. Will we take a controversial stand for the cross as Christians? Will we step up and do it too? Because here's the reality, that these Judaizers wanted to be Christians without the hardship that comes with being a Christian. They didn't want to take a controversial stand by saying something like, if you believe in Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. You don't have to follow the Old Testament law of Torah anymore. They didn't want to be persecuted for that. So they just kind of went under the radar and said, yeah, you still have to do those things. Jesus is good, but you have to do those things too. But not Paul. He said, no, 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 that's not the gospel. It's not the good news if you have to do something to save yourself. It's only good news if Jesus did everything on the cross for you. So you've got to take a controversial stand. And the reality is that you can be a Christian, especially in our country, and not let people know about it. Kind of hide it. And it's always been true. It was true in the first century. But we, if we want to truly follow Jesus, if we want to truly do what Paul teaches us to do, we have to take a controversial stand. We don't want to be like Kraft Mac and Cheese. Did you know this? A couple of years ago, they changed their ingredients and no one noticed. Do you remember this story back in 2015? 
Back at the very end of 2014, they changed the ingredients because they wanted to go all natural. So they got rid of all the artificial flavoring and all that stuff. They wanted to go all natural, but they didn't tell anyone. They sold 50 million more boxes of mac and cheese before they announced it. And then they said, hey, you guys didn't notice we changed uh, all our ingredients, but it tastes the same, doesn't it? Okay, that was good. They were trying to get healthier. You know, they, they were getting rid of all the yellow dye and replacing it with like r real ingredients, which is a good thing, I'm sure but nobody noticed. We don't want to be Christians like that. We don't want to be Christians like that. We want to change our lives so people notice, even if it means it's going to be controversial and get us into trouble. Justin Welby is now the Archbishop of the Church of England, the Archbishop of Canterbury. He's the highest ranking um, spiritual leader in that entire church. But when he went to college and when he was actually um, pursuing, I believe, his doctorate, he was at Cambridge and he wasn't a Christian. He said, I, I vaguely believe that there's this God out there, but I don't know about this Jesus. Uh, I, he didn't believe in it and wasn't interested at all. So if you would have asked him, was he a Christian? He probably would have said, yeah, but he didn't live like it, didn't change anything about him. But one night while he was there studying at Cambridge, he was with a Christian friend and talking with him and he prayed and accepted Christ. And this is what he wrote. He says, I, I felt a clear sense of something changing, the presence of something that had not been there before in my life. And then he, he said this, I said to my friend, please don't tell anybody about this. Because I was desperately embarrassed that this had happened to me, like getting measles. This is what happens to some of us when we first become Christians. We kind of like want to leave it on the DL. Okay, don't, don't tell anybody. I, I don't want people to know because I don't want to be embarrassed by it. I don't want to be made fun of. For some people, I don't want to get hurt or persecuted because of it. But the reality is that, that in our life, if we want to truly follow Jesus, it demands that we take a controversial stand. It demands it. And, and Jesus talked about this. He promised that it wouldn't be easy. In John 15, 19, he said, the world would love you if you belong to it, but you don't. For I chose you to come out of the world and so it hates you. Did you know that was part of following Jesus? People will hate you. Paul in 2 Timothy 3.12 said, everyone who wants to live the way God wants in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. This is what it means to be a Christian. We will take a controversial stand. Maybe not at first, but even Justin Welby, he eventually realized God had called him to be a pastor. And he did. He went to seminary, changed his life, and now he can't really hide it. He wears a collar everywhere. But he realized it was worth it, even if it meant people would look at him funny or treat him poorly or even persecute him. So this means, as Christians, if we believe the cross as it really significantly means then we may be made fun of. We probably will. We see it all over the media, all over popular television. In school, students, you will probably get a bad rap. People may make fun of you, laugh at you. If you're in some fields in our country, in certain fields of study or, or um, with your career, you may be barred from positions. You might be denied tenure because of your beliefs. You might not be able to practice certain things. But the reality is, is that we have it pretty easy in our country. And, and I imagine things could get much worse. They have around the rest of the world. I heard one quote by someone who said, in many places in the world, the church fears the raised fist. In America, the church fears the raised eyebrow. You may not know it, but Christianity is the most persecuted religion in the entire world. In 2016, there were 90,000 Christians killed because of their faith. And that's down from the decade before then. Gordon Conwell Seminary has studied it and estimates that every year for a decade, 100,000 Christians on average who have been killed because of their faith. British researcher Rupert Short declared that Christians are targeted more than any other body of believers. That 200 million Christians are socially disadvantaged, harassed, or actively oppressed for their beliefs. And the Pew Research Forum 
has found that Christians are harassed in over 151 countries worldwide. But when we believe in Jesus Christ, when we put our faith in him alone, not anything we do, it will be controversial. And we will join with the Christians around the world who go through this. If you want stories about this, talk with Jimmy. I'm sure he could tell you a lot about what's happening in the Middle East. If you become a Christian in some countries, it's legal for people to track you down your own family and kill you. Maybe it's not technically legal, but it happens. But we as Christians have to realize in our country, we may be embarrassed, we may be made fun of, we may face difficult things, but we have to do it. The cross demands it of us. Paul was willing to do it because that's what the true gospel changes for our lives. It gives us a new identity. So will you take a stand for Jesus? Despite the consequences, despite the repercussions that may come to you, will you take a stand for him? I challenge you to think about it. This is one of the reasons why Jesus taught us to practice baptism, and that's why we, we do that here. If you believe in Jesus Christ and you're baptized, that's one way you're saying publicly, I'm with Jesus. I don't care what happens to me. I'm with Jesus, and we practice that here too. So if you're interested in that, you can mark that on your connection card and, and turn that in at the end in one of the boxes on your way out because I, I want to see you make that public stand. But we have to take a stand in our workplaces, with our friends, with our family. It can be really challenging, but the cross demands it because the cross changes who we are. So that's maybe the harder aspect, right, of our new identity in Christ. But there's also some great benefits and amazing things because we can leave the hard, horrible things from our past behind. And that's going to be the second point. So I want to pick up again in verse 14. Paul said, Man, never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the new creation. What counts is the new creation. I don't care about all of that stuff. What matters is that I have been made new in Jesus Christ. And I love how it's called the new creation. We see this again in 2 Corinthians 5.17, where Paul said, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. The old life is, is gone. The guilt that we used to have, the shame that we had in our past, is gone. We have a new identity in Jesus Christ. I love how he says the language new creation there those two times because think about it. God created the entire universe out of nothing. Ex nihilo. That means from nothing God created the universe. It started with nothing and boom, here's something. In the same way, God says, I don't care about your past. I'm going to make you completely new. You're born again. It's like you get a new start. Everything is new for you. You get a new heart placed inside of you so that you can love God and start to hate sin. You have a new spirit that leads you along in your life. Your identity is completely made new. And look at verse 16. He says, Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, the rule of Christ, to the Israel of God. Now this is a really interesting point because it just kind of seems thrown in there, but he's saying to Christians, the church, he's saying, you guys are now the Israel of God. Paul said this as someone who was an Israelite, a descendant, he, literally he could trace his descendant to Benjamin, to Saul, you know, the first king of Israel. He, he said, okay, I have this Jewish heritage, but now because of Jesus Christ, there's a new Israel, a new people of God. And we as Christians become part of spiritual Israel. Israel as a nation still exists, as a people group, it still is there, and God still has a special place for them. But now as Christians, we are engrafted, brought into that family. That's why he said back in chapter 3, verse 7, understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. That blessing that Abraham had was given, that you will be blessed and the world will be blessed through you, is now our blessing. Being part of the family of God, now we're adopted in. We have a new family, and that's part of our new identity as well. And so our second point is that the cross gives you a new identity. It gives you a new identity. You can be a new person, completely transformed, a new creation. As if out of nothing, 
And this is amazing because a lot of us want that new identity. And here it is for you, given to you. And it does change you, it transforms you. I think in our world, a lot of the ways we get a new identity is through a brand. Have you noticed that? It's through a brand. In fact, there was a study done a few years ago that found that for, for a lot of people, a brand, especially a big brand like Nike or Harley Davidson, is more significant to people than their religious faith. And they identify with it more. They wear the clothes for it. They talk about it. But the reality is, is that in Jesus Christ, that's the way to a new identity. Not by what you wear, the logos that you have. I mean, th those are fun. We can, we can like those things. We can love our sports team. But no, no, no. Jesus is who we find our identity in. He is the one that transforms everything. It's not by wearing a t-shirt, but it's by the love we show to others that we can be known as a Christian. So are you willing to take this new identity upon you? Are you willing to become new, to be transformed? Because if you put on a t-shirt with the logo that you love, oh yeah, if, if you go out there with your, your bike and you're like, yeah, I've been working on it all week. Okay, that only lasts for a short time. What if you forget to wear the shirt? What if your bike breaks down or, or you're away from it? Then you have to tell people, hey, I own a Harley. I, don't, I have an iPhone, I'm an Apple guy. It's like, no, 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 no. In Jesus Christ, it transforms you forever. There's no taking it off. He changes you, and from the inside out, you are made new, to be given a new life, better than anything that came before. Do you remember last summer from the 2016 Olympics, Maya Dorado? She was one of the swimmers for the U.S. Olympic team, gold medal winning. She gave an interview um, last year about her swimming, and she said, you know, I'm a child of God, and that is way more important than anything I do or achieve in the pool. And she said this, knowing Jesus Christ, giving her a new identity, she said, it has helped me remember that there are so many more important things in life. She said this, swimming is a pretty selfish activity. And so I've always known that it can't be my whole world. It can't be my identity. I think God cares about my soul and whether I'm bringing his love and mercy into the world. Can I be a loving, supportive teammate? And can I bless others around me in the same way God has been so generous with me? I mean, a lot of Olympic athletes, if they're a gold medal, they wear that for the rest of their life. I mean, that's their identity, who they are. But not for her. She says, it doesn't matter. What's more important than that is my identity in Christ. Do you remember Alice Cooper? A lot of you loved his music maybe growing up. Alice Cooper, the, you know, the shock rocker, right? He um, shared his testimony. And he said that towards the end of his um, career, I guess he's still making some music, but he, he said during his, the end of his touring, he said, I was throwing up blood every morning. I was, really, I was a really bad alcoholic. I wasn't a cruel or mean alcoholic, but I was certainly self-destructive. He said, and when I stopped drinking, I started going back to church with my wife. And there was this pastor in Phoenix who was just hellfire, he said. Every week, every Sunday, he was preaching just to him. And every weekend, he said, I was exhausted getting out of church. I'd come out and be like, I don't want to go back. It was like torture, and I always came back. And then he said this, I finally realized I had to go on one side or the other. I had to make a decision for one side or the other because I was so convicted. The Lord really convicted me, saying, look, it's time to make a decision here. And I said, okay. And he became a member of that church. He decided that that would be his new identity moving forward. Bet you didn't know that about old Alice Cooper, did you? The truth is, is that Jesus Christ offers us a new identity, no matter what our past is, whether it's success or, or failure, whether it's shame or, or, or things that, you know, in the past we've been proud of. Even Paul, he was proud of being Jew for a long time, and then he realized, no, that's nothing. It's garbage. My new identity is what matters. Being found in Christ is who I am. It's not about what I do in my career it's not about my family. It's not about what I wear, the, the brands I, I like. It's not about my sexual identity. No, it's about being found in Jesus Christ. He alone is our new identity. 
And the reality is that when you're willing to do that, it will change you completely and make you the person better than you've ever been. It will give you a new purpose, like Maya Dorado talked about, to love and show mercy to others. We, we are given something new and better. Tim Keller writes, he said, God invites us to come as we are, not to stay as we are. So we come with all our baggage, all our past, our past identity, our sin, our guilt, everything that's been weighing us down. And we come to Jesus Christ and he transforms us. Slowly, sometimes quicker, sometimes it seems like we go backwards, but he transforms us day by day until we are more like his son, Jesus Christ. That's what our big idea is today, that the cross changes everything. The cross changes everything about who we are and what we're about. It gives us a new identity. And yes, we may face persecution. We may face hardship. Jesus said you will. But we're saying it's worth it because our lives are transformed now for Jesus Christ. It changes everything about us. In the Bible, you see all these names being changed. You see Abram becoming Abraham, Sarai to Sarah, Jacob to Israel, Simon becomes Peter the Rock, and even Saul became Paul. Our identity is completely transformed. We are a new person, a new creation. Everything has changed. In Revelation 2.17, we are told that to the one who is victorious, those, are us who, those of us who believe in Jesus Christ, I will give that person a white stone with a new name written on it. God gives us each a new name. We might not know it right now, but he does. We're given a completely new identity because in Jesus we are transformed. So will you accept the identity God has for you? Some of you are still living in your past. Some of you are still holding on saying, I don't want to take the controversial stand yet, Matt. I challenge you. Would you today say, Jesus is my identity. The cross is transforming everything about me. I don't care what negative things will happen because the positive things weigh, uh, outweigh them. It's going to be so much more amazing to have the eternal life that Jesus Christ has for me. This new family that I have in Jesus Christ. That's way better than anything I had in the past. Will you become the new creation? The very last verse of Galatians says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen. Paul wraps it up again by talking about grace. God's grace is what enables all of this to happen. So, if you're here today, um, and, and you're saying, Matt, I've never decided to follow Jesus Christ. I'm like Justin Welby, and maybe I thought I was a Christian, and I wasn't interested at all, but today I'm ready for that new identity. I want to challenge you to say a prayer and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If you're here too, and you said, I, I, I'm a Christian, but I've kind of been hiding it. I didn't want people to know about it. I don't talk about it. Somebody asked me, I even deny it. I've been there. Will you today say, I'm going to take that new identity upon myself and I don't care what the repercussions are. I'm going to stand with Jesus Christ. And for those of us who, who are still having this baggage in our past, maybe you're saying, I have this new idea. I'm not afraid to tell people I'm a Christian, but I still have this guilt and baggage from my past. People still look at me. Today, I want you to just accept that new idea, identity. Take it upon yourself. Be clothed in the righteousness of Christ so that you can stand from here on out because of the cross changing you forever. Transformed. You know, in this series, I, I said, it, you know, he starts with grace, ends with grace. I just wanted to recap a little bit of what we've learned in Galatians. In our first week in this book, we learned that there's no other gospel. There's one good news. That's why we don't add, have additives, preservatives, substitutes, or modifications. And then in the second week, we talked about that we can trust that message from Jesus Christ because it comes from Jesus himself. That's what he preached. That's what he taught Paul, and Paul teaches to us. And we learned in week three that at the core of the gospel, at the very center of it, is our justification. That when we believe, we are made right with God. It's just as if I'd never sinned. Then we saw that this salvation, from the beginning till the very end, is by the Holy Spirit. It's nothing that we do. God does everything for us. In week five, we learned that this gospel isn't like other religions. It's way better than religion, isn't it? Because it's not about what we do, but it's what God has done for us. And then in week six, we learn that as we grow up in our faith, we become children of God. 
into this new family. And in this family, that's where we find true freedom. That's what week seven was about. The freedom from sin, freedom from the law, and a true freedom that's only found in Jesus Christ. And week eight, we learn to stand firm in that freedom because legalism and law tries to push us back into it. But no, we're going to stand firm in the freedom of Jesus Christ. Because in week nine, we are not just set free from sin and the flesh, but we're also set free for something. To love God, to love others. And we learn that because of that, we're not just responsible for ourselves last week, we're responsible for everyone around us as well. We carry our burden, yes, but we carry other burdens too. And today we see that the cross changes everything, gives us a new identity, and it alone can transform us. So will you guys stand with me on the gospel? All this stuff, all the beauty that comes out of it, all the things that transforms our life, will you be with me and say, hey, Matt, we're going to keep the gospel 100% pure, we're not going to add anything to it. We're not going to modify it. We're going to stand true in this gospel because it alone saves. It alone transforms us. Will you stand with me? Will you take the bold stand and saying, this is my identity as a church and as a person? Because th this is one of the reasons why we've done Forward Faster is because we need a new identity as a church, don't we? We need to say we're moving forward and, and some things in the past have changed some of our baggage in the past. We want to leave behind. We want to move forward and say, I don't care about the turmoil in the past. God has called us to a new thing. That's what Forward Faster is about as well. Because in Christ alone, because of the cross, we can have a new identity. So I'm going to say a prayer for us right now as individuals, and, and the band's going to come up and, and lead us in a final song. And as I pray, if you want to accept Jesus Christ for the first time or, or claim Jesus as your identity, I, I'm going to lead you in a prayer so that you can do that as well. So let's all just bow our heads right now and close our eyes. God, for the person who's here right now and they said, Matt, uh, I've been challenged. I've been challenged because I haven't accepted Jesus yet. For that person, I pray that your Holy Spirit would stir in them, that they would be like that story about Alice Cooper who says, you know, I didn't want to go back. I didn't want to hear preaching anymore, but I had to. And that they would finally accept you as their Lord and Savior. And I pray right now that you'd be with them. And as they sing this last song, let them declare, Holy Spirit, come inside my life. For the person who's here today and is saying, I'm ready now for this to be my identity. That I will say, Jesus is my Lord, no matter what happens to me. Pray, Lord, that you'd give them courage to stand firm in that. And for all of us, let us know that the cross can change our lives, can transform us from the inside out. And I pray for your blessing in that as we move forward. Amen.